Good morning. I want to thank the New York Times team for letting us come and share our story with you. I want to talk to you about Memphis Meats. My name is Uma Valeri. I'm a cardiologist. I founded this company with Nick, my co-founder, in September 2015. And I want to talk to you about what we're doing. We're raising animal cells instead of animals to grow meat. And if you think about the market size for meat right now, it's a trillion dollars, and it's expected to double in the next 30 to 35 years. That's an enormous market, right? At the same time, consumers are paying attention like never before to the food quality, health, impact on environment and animal welfare. And meat production really hasn't changed in the last 10,000 years. If you think the numbers of human population growing from 7 billion to 10 billion are you know, kind of scary, you're correct. Tom Friedman said it's the mother of all hockey sticks. But how often do you get to correct Tom Friedman and point him to a different direction and reshape his message. I had that chance in the green room. I told him the numbers that are actually driving the mother of all hockey stick that should make us scared are the 70 billion animals that are already uh, used in the animal agriculture system now. And if the meat uh, industry is doubling, the market size is doubling, we can't afford to have 150 billion animals on the planet in 30 years. And if you play that over 10 years, that's 1.5 trillion animals living on Earth in a 10-year cycle. That's never happened before. And this is why it's scary. Because right now, for raising um, animals for meat, we use about a third of all the fresh water, nearly half of all the arable land, and about one-fifth of all greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture. If you look at Paul Hawkins' work uh, in the Drawdown Report, he says if cattle were their own country, they would be the third largest country in the world emitting greenhouse gases. That's scary. And we can't have this double because it's going to completely disrupt our water, land, food systems. But what if I told you, you could have delicious meat every time you crave beef, pork, or chicken without raising an animal? You probably won't believe me. So let me show you how we're doing this. This is, this is our work. So let me walk you through the bottom part of this first. All animals start from cells. These cells then grow inside an animal. There will be about 30 trillion cells in a cow or, uh, or, 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 or a sheep or, or a pig. And they're raised. And at the time of slaughter, meat is produced. And then they're cooked in all the products we love to eat. We're only proposing to change one step in this process, where we still start from the cells. These cells are already there in the steak that we eat or in the chicken uh, breast. Some of these cells are capable of renewing themselves. We isolate them. We put them in a clean, nutritious environment. And we give them what? you would expect a baby calf to eat and grow. Things that are very familiar, proteins, amino acids, lipids, sugars, water, oxygen. We let them grow, and then once it's, the meat is ready to harvest, we harvest, and then it just enters the same way you cook meat. So that's what we're proposing. But I think the fundamental thing here, here is we're saying throughout the history of humanity, meat always came from animals. So meat equals animals. We're saying meat's coming from meat now. And what if we can meet the demand of meat that's exploding in the next 30 years. Let me show you some products, because I don't think you'll believe me until I show you some products. This is a delicious meat, beef meatball. We did last year, and we had a session of tasting, and it, it was debuted to rave reviews, and uh, the video went viral. But it took us about six weeks to do this, under six weeks to, to raise the beef and cook it into a meatball. Compare that to 18 to 24 months for raising an animal before it goes to slaughter. I think uh, we can do that because the purpose of the meat that we're raising is purely for consumption or eating. It doesn't have to live and support you know, animal running around, healing broken bones, raising babies. So I think we're kind of taking a path where let's put the best meat on the table with the best profile on it. I want to show you some more products. Earlier this year, we debuted two different species, poultry. And what we have on the slide is duck. Um, this was cooked uh, in the style of duck l'orange, uh, popularized by Julia Childs in a kitchen actually around the corner where she used to teach. Uh, we had a number of people in the room, including uh, reporters from uh, a very prominent newspaper, not called New York Times though. Uh, uh, but what we had was the first time ever bird meat being produced without raising a bird. And we had we had the ability to put the meat directly on the pan and grill it without anything added to it, except some spices. 
And the chef from Cargill, who came later on to taste the same product, the head chef, he said, I'm blown away. This is one of the best ducks I've ever tasted. Now, we did this for two reasons. One, we wanted to show that our platform could be global. As you know, duck is one of the most popular meats in China. And China consumes about 9 billion pounds of duck every year, much more than the rest of the world combined. So we wanted to show that this is a global platform. And number two, we also wanted to show we can do multiple species. We did beef, we did duck, and then we also did chicken on the same day. Chicken, as you know, is the most popular protein or meat in the US. And we picked southern fried chicken because that's, again, iconic. It's one of the most uh, uh, delicious uh, meats people, people identify with chicken. But I'm, I'm showing you the one that's cut here to show you the texture. Because not only is taste identical, in many ways we think it's better, but we also want to show texture. Because when you eat meat, there's features in there that are taste, texture, the bounciness and the chewiness, we want to be able to show that we have, they have the ability to start showing texture in the meat. And this was really important for some of our investors because they said, great, your team has really done well on the taste, but show us that you're showing progress on texture. And this was specifically done for that. I'm going to take you to some non-appetizing pictures now. This is what happens when you start testing all the foods in a lab. And I, again, most of the foods we eat, they come from a lab at some point. Cheerios, what designed in a lab, or lots of food products that we eat from any restaurant, they're designed in a lab and they come out. But in terms of testing them, I'm showing you three plates. These are three different plates, three bacteriologic plates. And on the left side, we have conventional poultry. In the middle, there's organic poultry. And then on the right side, it's Memphis Meats poultry. What we did was we put uh, poultry in those plates and left them out at room temperature for two days. And they all started as if they were clean when they, when they were, very similar to what the one on, the, on your uh, right-hand side is. But within eight hours or so, we started seeing bacterial growth. And by 24 hours to 48 hours, it essentially fills the plate. And you can see that the conventional and organic have slightly different flora. And our scientists tell me these are very typical of E. coli and salmonella growing. And the reason I'm showing this is fundamentally, when we detach slaughter from meat production, you drastically minimize the chance of getting bacterial contamination in there, which happens at two places. One is when an animal is slaughtered and it's, it, you know, there's, a sl there's a slit in the middle and the animal is peeled off. It's called peeling a banana in the industry. The, the bacteria from the skin gets into the meat. And the second one is when you ligate the guts of the animal. That's when the feces can go into uh, the meat that's being produced or processed. Once you detach that, you do not have the chance of contamination as much. So we drastically minimize the risk. And this means a lot for supply chains and refrigeration and keeping things fresh and reducing waste. So this has been replicated by all the in all the species when we test them uh, in our lab. Now we're also looking at what consumers are talking about this product. Although people have been talked about, talking about this for almost 80 or 90 years. In, st in fact, Winston Churchill in 1932 said, what if we can just grow the parts of an animal we love to eat instead of growing the entire animal? So this has been out there for a while. People have been talking about the solution. Um, and if you look historically at what, how the reactions of consumers are, they've always been really good. But we are noticing in the last two years, once we started showing what these products look like, there's a significant interest. The, the, the most recent one is an academic paper I'm quoting here, where two-thirds of the US demographics said they'd be very interested in clean meat. This whole industry is being called clean meat, uh, by the way. And about half of them said they would completely switch to clean meat from conventional meat. And even if you look at surveys that have been done previously, the, the worst of those surveys are around 20% acceptance rates, and the best are around 86%. Now, if you are an entrepreneur and you're taking a big idea out, those are huge early adopter markets. And there's even before we as a company went out there and started educating or talking to people about what we're doing, what the benefits are, what the impact of this could be. So we're really excited about the consumer sentiment. We have a lot more work to do. We have to get this out in front of people. And I can tell you the magic really happens not when we're talking about it or showing pictures, but when someone is in the room watching our chefs cook it and tasting it. I think that's when the magical moment happens. What does it look like at scale? Clean meat production at scale, because of how it's produced, we think has enormous impact in lowering the use of land, water, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by nearly tenfold. And that's because the production cycle is focused on meat, not raising an animal through its entire life cycle. If it's a, if it's a young steer, beef cattle, 18 to 24 months. If it's a dairy cow, span, span dairy cow, it could be five, six years. You don't need to wait that long to get really high quality meat. So I think we think about all of this, 
There may be other solutions that can purely lower greenhouse gas emissions by 100x or 50x, let's say. But the, the key thing here is, historically, we've always evolved to eat meat. We are finely calibrated as creatures to understand the taste and the texture of meat. And we can do this without taking the choice away from people that they could continue to do what they're eating but have a significantly lower footprint. We're intentionally building a very big tent. Clearly, we're talking about people from various fields, impact investors, financial investors, or meat industry incumbents. All of them, we're trying to bring under the same tent to show the potential that we could have people eat what they love, but we could also do it a lot more sustainably. And this is intentional as we build our team as well as our partners. And we've done all of this in under two years. And now we're accelerating the production, taste, texture. And it's really important for us to know that when we put products out there, it'll be 100% authentic meat that people love to eat with a much lower footprint. And we really believe that we could have a future where there could be a better meat and better world. Thank you very much.